I am reading about this. I try to read every case there is, and I'm doing a lot of writing and attending a lot of events, doing a lot of teaching. Uh, one of the things that puzzled me the first year, year and a half of reading this is why there was so many spoliation sanctions going on. And talking to my partners, I must have like 200 litigation partners or, and associates that I back up when discovery questions come. And seeing what was going on in, in the larger world of litigation is that it wasn't a focus so much anymore about getting ready for the trial and getting the truth of the facts. Uh, the, uh, keynote last night, whatever happened to the truth. It was about avoiding losing the case through accidental spoliation or winning the case by proving the other side was not being forthright. And, you know, this is unheard of in the first 25 years. There was almost never spoliation motions. This, I only remember one before the uh, computers came in. And I got, you know, kind of, I couldn't understand what was happening to the bar that there's now so much evidence being destroyed by parties and by attorneys and that the, the focus now is on sanctions and spoliation for not keeping evidence and not producing evidence. And I really didn't know the answer to that. So I've been thinking about this for some time. I've sort of mused about that out loud in, in this weekly blog I've been writing for over two years now uh, where I write a uh, three to 5,000 word essay every weekend that's sort of a, much to my wife's uh, a dismay, uh, kind of killing Sundays, and, and trying to, you know, I write up case after case. I'm sure you've heard of the uh, Coleman v. Morgan Stanley case. Everybody heard of that case? Not so much here. It's not because It's the most downloaded case that Lexis has, according to Lexis. So it's a state court case. Now, you wouldn't find it, but they published it because there was a judgment entered against Morgan Stanley this is one, they still have money that wasn't our money. Morgan Stanley, uh, based upon a default being entered, an adverse inference sanction being imposed because they lost email. I mean, they lost millions of emails. We don't really know how much they lost. So they lost the whole case on liability. All that was left was a trial on damages. The jury whacked them for one and a half billion. That's the billion dollars. State court went up on appeal and, and was reversed, not because of the sanctions, because they didn't get the damage claim right. And the sanctions part still stood. And I can tell you, just the last couple of weeks, another state court case in West Palm Beach, I was asked to look at it, whether we would take over the case where they had lost another case, again, not Morgan Stanley, different players. They weren't New York lawyers this time. They came down to West Palm Beach. They, they got uh, this handed to them. It was Local lawyers in West Palm Beach on both sides, same thing. Different judge, same court, entered sanctions, striking their pleadings. Regardless of the merits, striking the pleadings because they didn't uh, produce all of the information. They actually discovered a computer they didn't know they had, and that made the judge angry. And now they're faced with a trial in January just on the amount of damages that will be imposed on them. Guess what? $20 million is what they're seeking. So this kind of thing is going on all the time. There's all kinds of cases that never get seen by the judges where we are forced to settle because we know that we cannot afford the expense and cost involved to do e-discovery. And the clients, you know, if they could, this is part of their problem too. They could be better organized in their information, but they're not. And so rather than engage in the actual pursuit of truth, they're being forced to settle for too high a number because they don't want to go there and one side is forcing them to go there. So, you know, why is it that all of a sudden we have all of this seemingly unethical behavior on the part of lawyers and parties? Uh, and, and it wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't believe that sudden, suddenly there had been a moral decline. There was something else to it. And I also, I didn't see these kind of spoliation cases in other parts of the law. I mainly saw them in e-discovery. So I started to think about what, what is it that's driving that? And then um, when I got the invitation to do this, I, this is kind of, you know, you need a deadline to get things done, as, as Judge mentioned. So I, I set myself the task to try and figure this out. And this is the thesis I'm going to present to you today. It's in the written paper that you have as well, which is a draft. And I, the law review is going to be publishing it. I already discovered one error when I was looking at it this morning, guys, so I'll fix that. But this, uh, you know, you can read uh, my full presentation in this handout. Is this been distributed? Uh, not to everybody, but uh, well, it's there. It's called Lawyers Behaving Badly, 
understanding professional conduct and e-discovery. And to those of you that are uh, over 30, there's apparently a TV show called Men Behaving Badly. I wouldn't know any of this popular stuff but for my son and daughter telling me about it. Uh, apparently, men behaving badly has to do a lot of it with anatomical parts of the body of both sexes or something. Like that. So this is the lawyers, <laughs> this is the lawyers behaving badly uh, essay to try and explain, you know, what my idea of why it is that there's all of this bad faith conduct, particularly in the area of the discovery. And I targeted it so we could try and, and see. It's, uh, I came up with this. My hobby is making PowerPoints, by the way, in case you wondered if I was a nerd or not. Uh, <laughs> and I came up with this one. I hope you enjoy it. And this is what I thought were the four forces that are driving the ethical situation here with e discovery and lawyer conduct. First of all, is zealous advocacy. This is one of the things we are required to do. I was trained by a, a firm with some old line uh, litigators, and uh, believe me, they were zealous advocates. And I, my prime duty, I know, is always to my client, but it's balanced by other duties. And uh, you know, prime duty is something I'm, I'm showing my uh, my bias right there. That's the way I was taught. That's you know, hardball litigation, but but play by the rules. In addition to that, there's the duties to the court. Now, these are supposed to be countervailing. And as you'll see, in order to do that, you have only two rules in the model rules that uh, talk about your duties to your client. You have a bunch of rules, four or five of them, about duties to your profession. These should be in balance, and then the system will work properly. But the other factors in e-discovery uh, are technology and law. And by technology, I'm referring to the fact that in the course of my professional life, the evidence has completely changed. Completely changed. When I started practicing law in the early 80s, it was all paper. Now, guess what? Most law schools don't know that it's completely changed. And I'll pick on the University of Florida, where we're one of the leaders with Bill Hamilton. But in our trial practice there, my son just took, the way they prepare for trial is they each get like 20 pages of documents. Well, there hadn't been a 20-page document case in decades. And guess what? There aren't paper cases anymore either. Most of the profession doesn't know this, but our clients mainly are using computers to store information in. And if you just are looking for evidence in the filing cabinet, you're not looking for where the evidence is. The real evidence is in the computers. It's in mainly the email. And so to practice in today's uh, world uh, where the businesses and society and individuals now store information not on dead trees with stained liquids, but they're now storing it as zeros and ones. That's the reality. Most of our profession, though, doesn't understand this or doesn't want to understand that because they're not really understanding technology. They don't like technology. Law school doesn't attract technology types. You know, if I wanted to learn about math and science, I would have gone to med school. And that's part of the problem, too, is that uh, we're not really preparing many of our students to enter today's digital world because we're not addressing that. My son told me, you can, you can go to be admitted to law school and go all the way through and not know how to turn on a computer. And I hand it to Mercer. You, re you issue a laptop. So I think maybe you have to know how to turn on a computer here, but you're the rarity. Most law schools, you don't. They use computers, but it's really not part of your tool set. So we have these four different factors that I think are underlying why we're getting unprofessional conduct. The final, uh, the technology challenge and also legal competence touched upon in the last panel. And the, those are the other factors is that you need to know the law. Most uh, lawyers do not really know e-discovery law. That they can learn on their own. That's within our ability. That you're taught to do, just to learn what the law is. Uh, but it's not being done yet. And when you have confidence in knowing what the law requires, what your duties are, that can help you do the right thing. Because what we're talking about here is doing the right thing. That's what it's really all about. And, and I'll tell you what, it's better in the long run to do the right thing and sleep well than to do something that probably isn't right, you know it, and make a lot of money. 
But that's the hard reality of choices. You're going to be faced with time and time again. You're going to have scenarios that we can't even dream of now involving third life or something like that, where you're going to know and feel what the right thing to do is, and uh, but the client may be urging you to do the wrong thing, and you got to step up to the plate, and you got to either resign, counsel them so they do the right thing, but whatever you do, don't make the mistake of doing what you know is wrong in your heart and then pick and make, making a lot of money for it, but not being able to sleep well at night. That, that's what legal ethics is really all about, is, is training yourself to do the right thing, even though it can be hard. Um, you know, not everybody has a Professor Friedman to call up when you have a problem, too. I'm, I'm fortunate in a larger firm, we have a full-time ethics uh, officer that we can call up. Uh, and I use that a lot. I give them a call. I don't know what the scenario is, and they give ethical advice. I would urge you, just as a practical matter, having nothing to do with e-discovery, when you're faced with this and you're out in the real world and you're faced with an ethical dilemma, don't just decide it on your own. Get some outside advice. Florida has a 1-800 hotline you can get anonymous advice from the bar. Go out and seek professional counsel in this area. Whatever you do, don't make the wrong decision. Even if you get away with it, you won't get away with it because you'll know in your heart you did the wrong thing and it's going to plague you for your whole career. Now back to e-discovery. The two forces that I think that are at work here, and this is spelled out in the article so I won't go into great detail, is the duties to the client, the duties to your profession. Both are important. Diligence we've talked about as a really the core of, of doing everything you can possible within the law and the boundaries to represent your client. That's got to be balanced out. And the other, uh, other duty you have is to keep your client's secret secret. Keep your information confidential that are disclosed to you. That's on the one hand. But then on the other hand, you have the duties to be competent in your profession, and here now we start getting into more sometimes conflict, expediting litigation. What if your client doesn't want to expedite litigation? What if you're a defendant that says, I hope this never goes to trial. Delay this baby as long as you can. Maybe they'll run out of money. Maybe they'll settle for cheap. This is not just, this is everyday real world stuff. There's a lot of parties in litigation that wish they would never go to trial. And most of the time they're right, because only 2% of the cases in the federal uh, system go to trial. 98% of them it goes away one way or the other. And a lot of times it goes away because it's been hanging around for so long. One side or the other runs out of money or it just gets tired of it and forced to settle for either too much or not enough. The other duty is a candor towards the tribunal. Uh, you know, when, when I'm in front of a judge, any judge, if they ask me a question, I think long and hard, and I tend to give long answers, and they end up saying, okay, that's enough, low <laughs> it, It's because I want to be sure I am telling them everything as honest and accurate as I can. And, and that's right. I mean, when they ask me what my bottom line is settlement, everybody knows you lie about that. But if I'm in front of any judge and they ask me a question, there's no, you know, you have to tell the truth. You can't shade the truth to a judge. And yet, this is happening. Qualcomm v. Broadcom the big ethics case of the year, probably the decade, the district court judge practically made a finding that one of the senior litigators at a firm established in San Francisco in 1860, I shouldn't say their name, anyway, the Heller Ehrman firm, uh, a senior <laughs> partner of my age, uh, was asked a direct question by the trial judge during trial at sidebar, and the judge said that he did not tell him the truth. Judges never say anybody lies. They just say he did not say the truth. Now, that's an awful thing, I think. And I, I think it's no coincidence that firm is now breaking up. Because one of the remedies that the, this judge considered that the magistrate should, should uh, look at when it was remanded back to him to evaluate what sanctions would be appropriate against these attorneys and against these parties is he said, he said, I want you to consider sending a letter to each and every one of uh, the law firm's clients sending them a copy of the judge's order which made these findings of unethical conduct by senior partners and by other lawyers, including a two-year associate. And the judge didn't, uh, you know, this just following orders doesn't work in front of a federal judge. You're an associate, you sign a discovery response, 
your license is on the line. So you better take it seriously. The judges do, and the bar should. Uh, and so that was one of the remedies. Send a letter to each and every client. Another remedy, he said, send a letter to each and every judge in every case that this law firm has a, a matter pending in, state and federal. Send them a copy of my order, which basically says these people are not playing fair, look out. Uh, now, ultimately, the magistrate did not impose those sanctions. And in fact, this case is still up in the air. There was an order entered. It's been remanded back. It will be tried probably in the spring of this year in what a lot of people are now calling the circle, circular firing squad, where the lawyers, Heller Ehrman and the other uh, firm, IP firm in California, are blaming Qualcomm and their attorneys. Qualcomm and their in-house counsel are blaming their outside counsel. And the first uh, trial, the court held that the attorney-client privilege silenced the outside counsel. They could not tell the truth of what happened. The district, and, and they got referred to disciplinary proceedings. The district court judge reversed that and said, that's not fair. This is the self-defense exception applies here. We're going to ungag the outside counsel, and they're now going to tell their version of the truth of why they hid 30,000 emails. And, it, it, and any of them came out, it was killing their case. Uh, it was not just hiding inconsequential, it was hiding core evidence. They deliberately hid it from the court, is what the evidence suggests. So now we're going to find out who was at fault. Was it the in-house lawyers that were at fault? Was it outside counsel? Those of us who have been around, I'm sure we're going to find both sides were at fault. By the way, we're talking big money here behind this. The other side got their fee award as a sanction, the defendants, Broadcom. And they're no innocent lambs either. The president, I think, was indicted, uh, uh, you know, for not their lawyers, but the president of, of Broadcom. And by the way, these companies are suing each other all over the country. There's a number of lawsuits involved. Uh, their fee award was eight and a half million dollars, just in this one case. So Heller Ehrman and the other attorneys representing Qualcomm, we're talking about they're getting paid over eight million dollars for one case. That's a lot of motivation to maybe bend the line, and maybe do what you shouldn't do, and then make that bad decision in the heat of trial to not tell the truth to the judge. And they're going to regret it, uh, and this is something that's a matter of public record, and now we're going to face a circular firing spot. Look for what happens in San Diego in the spring, what the truth comes out, who was at fault. I think you know, my prediction is you can find both sides. So the candor towards the tribunal, it's, it's critical. Nothing can trump that. You can't lie to a judge. There's no excuse for that. Final thing, a fairness to opposing party and counsel. A lot of lawyers in practice think this is, you know, they, they can't even really believe that that's actually an ethical rule because they don't, they're not fair. They think their job is to be unfair. That's wrong. You have to be fair. That doesn't mean you have to, well, here's the smoking gun, let me show it to you. But that's different than, I found the smoking gun, and you know what, I'm going to throw it away. That's unfair to opposing counsel. It's unfair to the opposing party. That's also a, a crime. That's destruction of evidence. You can't do that. I personally think that this has gone on among a few bad apple attorneys uh, from the dawn of our profession. There's some attorneys that get so involved in representing their client and being diligent that they will knowingly take evidence that they have found and they will either destroy it or they will put it in the filing cabinet to forget about it, even though there's a request for production clearly requiring them to produce it, they will not produce it. This has gone on for, I think, a long time. I've suspected it, that the other side's been doing it uh, throughout my career, and I know there's certain attorneys who start to know, look out for this guy, but it was very hard to catch him at it because it's easier to destroy and hide paper. Nowadays, in, with the uh, emails that never really go away and you think you delete it, it's easier to catch the bad guys. And that's part of, the, I think, the reason that we're now having this flood of spoliation sanctions and, and attorneys being caught is because with technology, you can't get away with it as easy anymore. It's, it is, uh, when you find the email that they say doesn't exist and you find it from a third party that got forwarded to, you can then start to prove that they knew they had it and they hid it. And this is where you get into the gray areas, too. You got the smoking gun against you. Our last panel mentioned this is one of the tough questions, I agree. And you don't withhold it because you interpret their request in such a narrow way that, oh, they didn't really ask for that. 
but, but that's not right. And you've got to think, is this something that I can tell to the judge that, in fact, this wasn't requested? Or is he going to look at you and say, that's baloney. That's not a reasonable interpretation. You were hiding evidence. You were not being fair to the tribunal or opposed the party. And these are the kind of decisions, even as a young associate, you're going to have to make because you're the ones often dealing with these kind of production requests. You're the ones signing your name, certifying that that is a reasonable and accurate response. So those are our duties and rules. Um, what I found, I think, is you know the client duties are outweighing it. And uh, as I mentioned in my article, the reality is there's a thumb on the scale here, and the thumb is the clients that are at war with the opposing party. I mean, this whole dispute resolution is in lieu of fisticuffs or dirty tricks. I think it was a Professor Friedman's article where he said he thinks that the lack of lawyers, not having enough lawyers in Japan, kind of explains the rise of, of their mafia over there, where they've settled disputes by uh, putting hits on people uh, the old-fashioned way, because they don't really have that much of a recourse in the uh, civil justice system. Interesting. Uh, so we, we don't kill each other too much, although it does happen. I mean, we do see, uh, it seems like, it, Seems like people try to hire hitmen, they always end up being working for the FBI. <laughs> like, what does the FBI do? They hang out in cars and pretend they kill people. Uh, you know, so it still does go on. But we want people to come into the courtroom to do it. But the clients, a lot of times, they don't want to play fair. They just want to win. And it's our job as legal counselor to explain to them, you have to play by the rules. And yes, you have information, you must give it to me. And I look at it, and we, and I must produce to them information that will hurt your case if it's been fairly requested. They don't get that. They, you know, it's my information. Why should I give it? And you know what? Most of the world doesn't get that either. It's, you know, in Europe, the whole idea of disclosing the information in your computer systems that might help the other side. No. And this is this is part of our system of justice. This unique is that we will voluntarily produce information that will hurt the other side if it's been requested. It will hurt us, hurt our clients. But believe me, this sounds easy in theory, but in practice, the clients aren't liking this a lot. And that will put pressure on you not to produce it. And you have to stand up for that. That's where you have to make the right decision, do the right thing. OK, but this really doesn't, just to call it uh, threefold, I don't really think uh, it does it justice, because this legal competence is a little bit different than just duty to the profession. I think that's what's really made the system work, is that there's been a lot of pride in doing your work right, uh, and in learning and being very competent. All throughout my career, until just recently, everybody took pride in attaining a high level of professional competency. And this would buttress your duty to the uh, profession, because to do the right thing in, uh, and to uh, fulfill your duties required a high level of skill where you could, the clients would rely upon you, they would take your advice because you were the best in a certain area, you were highly qualified in that area. And so really the, to understand it, you got to see there's three different forces at work here. This is again explained in the article. I want to try and, and wrap up and uh, so I'm very interested uh, for my panelists to uh, tune in on this. So you have the professional duties on the one hand, the duties to client, but then when you bring in the threefold, you see the two uplifting duties is the legal competence of doing the job well and doing the right thing, being honest to the court, being fair to opposing counsel, and then duties to the client on the other hand who doesn't necessarily want to do the right thing. They want to win. They either want to get the millions of dollars they're trying to get as a plaintiff or they don't want to pay the millions of dollars that they think is unfairly being demanded of them. And sometimes you're going to be make or break cases, the company will go down. Sometimes uh, in divorce cases or whatever, we're talking about uh, losing the right to see your own child. There's a very high component of emotion and involved in all of this stuff. And you don't really get that in law school until you're there and you see how angry people are at each other. And that's why they sue each other. So you got this threefold, two going up, one going to do something you may not want to do to sleep well. But the, the last thing is this shift to a computer, the technology part of it. The first panel's touched on it. I'm going to give you my own little uh, flavor to it. And uh, 
this is really what changes everything. This is what has made the competence issue so difficult for most lawyers who don't like computers. Uh, in that we have an incredible amount of ESI. That's your new rule buzzword, ESI. You've got to know that. If you know that, believe it or not, you know more than most uh, practicing lawyers that uh, when I say ESI without an explanation, they still don't know. Electronically stored information is not defined in the rules. Why? The minute you define it, somebody's going to invent something new. We have seen the greatest transformation in society in human history in the course of the past three decades where we have changed completely from paper to digital and we're now using a, a technology, this Mac Air, that people couldn't even dream of 20 years ago, much less embody. You can go down to Walmart and buy one terabyte uh, a drive for $200. So we've got the bottom line in uh, Jason Barron's got this terrific article, or review article, Information Inflation. You really need to read that. And he expands upon how dramatically society has changed and has changed uh, the way the evidence is stored. Uh, some of the stats you may have heard of, 60 billion emails a day. Your average employee in a company that's a middle level of senior executive gets at least 100 emails a day. And that's after uh, spam filters, 100 emails a day. I get almost that many a day. Uh, if I actually hand filed each one of those and classified it, I would spend another one or two hours a day. I'm fortunate I have an assistant, and they do file the stuff I don't delete, and I organize it. Most average businessmen are not like lawyers, they're not organized. It's just everywhere. It's a disorganized mess. They have, in, they have an inbox uh, just filled with thousands of emails. They don't even bother making subfolders for it. So 60 billion a day, this is, I think, an interesting stat, I think, you know, this is a um, information management school, Berkeley, University of California, they found, they did a study that there were five exabytes of ESI stored in computers in 2002. 30% increase each year. Now, what does that mean, five exabytes? Exabyte is a 10 with 18 zeros. Still, that sounds so bad. There's only five of them. Uh, but then you look at, okay, what's the largest library in the world? It's the United States uh, Library, Library of Congress, has 17 million books, or it did back in 02, probably has a lot more than Five exabytes equals 17 libraries of Congress restored in computers back in 2002. But still, what does this mean? And some people like to use, well, you could pile paper up to Mars and back. I like this other analogy that Berkeley used to try and explain it to people. Five exabytes equals all the words ever spoken. Ever spoken. Yeah. From the dawn of time up to now. That much was stored in our computers. And guess what? It has tripled since then. So in, in, I know how much some teenagers can talk. Can you imagine? From the dawn of time. So we're, it's just mind-boggling how much information there is out there. And it's not just... Uh, it's in businesses, too. Uh, I have a case right now I'm looking at, we narrowed it down to just 17 key custodians, 17 witnesses. I found that these 17 witnesses had data that had been created by people on their computer store. Uh, anybody want to hazard a guess how many typical corporate employee? Anybody want to go out there? Uh, this is where you get Carl Sagan-like. You know, how many pages of information do they have? All right, you know, it's hard to guess anyway. 17 employees had 13 million pages of information on their computer, user created information. 85% of that was in email and email attachments. The rest of it was in their My Documents area. And these were not people that had music either. As far as I've seen, they didn't have huge music or video files like you might find among your generation. These were people that just had spreadsheets. That's what most of it was. Unbelievable numbers of spreadsheets. So this is really testing the confidence of, of the legal profession to deal with this. And what we're faced with here is that uh, the challenges of technology is also kind of pulling down and tempting lawyers because they don't understand what's going on. Uh, a lot of non-lawyers do not understand and lawyers I decided to say some lawyers don't understand that email is actually evidence. And I, I mean, I have to say, well, I've saved my paper up. You have to save email? Yes. 
a lot of plaintiff's lawyers don't understand that they have to preserve, not just defense. And uh, so there's a knowledge gap here where the profession is being challenged by technology, they're being challenged by clients that want to win at all costs, and by, and by the way, they're the ones that pay all our bills. So they have a very strong influence on what we lawyers do, because without, you know, it's one thing to have the United States government, you know they're going to pay if you're a government lawyer. If you're a private lawyer like me, you never really know if you're going to pay. Once they burn through that retainer, they may or may not pay you. So the problem we've got now is that there's this huge downward pull, what I think, of uh, technology challenging people and this, uh, the motivation to go along with the client's request, even though you may not be sure it's right, because they're the ones paying the bills. And the net result of this is that you've got uh, a situation that's totally out of balance now. You've got duties to client is, is the paramount duty where all the focus is made on, the people that, that I've seen that really go the extra mile, the ones that are the bulldogs, excuse me, uh, of, uh, of the profession, of hire your own bulldog, it's popular image. There's, there's lawyers that like to advertise it, I'll be your bulldog, you know, I'll do what it takes to win your case. This is being rewarded, and these are the people that sometimes are the most successful lawyers in town. The ones that are the hardball players, they're making all the money, and they're getting all the clients, as opposed to the lawyer that says, no, I'm sorry, the law requires that you produce this information. You know, what the clients don't really like to hear the law requires, I have to do something I don't want to do. They love it when the, the lawyer says, okay, we can do this because you don't have to do it. <clears throat> so this is the duty to clients, got a financial reward, you got legal confidence that's being outweighed by the technology challenges, and you've got your advocacy restraints, the duties to profession, is being outweighed by the duties to client. Because the, du the duties to, uh, to the tribunal, honesty, opposing counsel, that in the long run is going to help all your clients. But in any, any one particular case, it may hurt your client. When you tell the truth to the judge, like the attorney did not do in the Qualcomm case, is, and are there other emails? He should have said the truth. Yes, we, we found at least 32. He didn't. Now, if the attorney had told the truth, that you know that judge then would have believed him. Maybe Heller Irwin wouldn't be in dissolution than it is today, which I don't think is accidental. That firm is coming apart. And in the long run, if I come into court and I say something to the judge, they're not going to go, I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. They're going to know he's telling the truth because he told me something that hurt his client the last time. I'm going to trust him. And guess what? That helps you in the long run because uh, if you have a, a lawyer that the judges don't believe, that lawyer can't be effective. Your reputation is the most valuable asset you have. And once your reputation is ruined, you, you're finished in this business because the judges won't believe you. And so in the long run, it is good for the clients to be honest and truthful to the tribunal, but they don't see the long run unless they're a repeat customer like a company sued all the time. They might. So you've got this imbalance here. Bottom line is what I call the wiki quadrants, where you have these huge technical challenges <laughs> are uh, causing the profession to make bad decisions, lawyers to make bad decisions. You have the duties to the client that are also very powerful. And now the small quadrants are the legal competence, because the lawyers don't know enough about technology to really understand and do e-discovery properly. And their advocacy duties, because they're just seeing the short term uh, and not understanding how important it is to always tell the truth and to be fair to opposing counsel. So this is basically the premise that I have as to the situation of, of, that we're in today, uh, as to why it is that you're going to, when you read in this area, you find hundreds, literally, and every day, there's, every week at least, there's one or two new cases of sanctions and spoliation. Why is this happening to our profession? I don't think it's because there's a moral decline. I think it's because we're being severely challenged by technology. We've allowed the duties to the client to outweigh the duties to the profession. And we're not keeping up um, on, on our competency level in this new area of practice. So I urge all of you in your future, to, when it comes time to you know, be faced with these tough choices, err on the side of caution, do the right thing. And in the present, now when you're in law school, you've got time to study. You're not going to have this time later on. When you have time to study, teach yourself something about e-discovery. Read about some of these cases I'm talking about. 
Because when you get out into practice, you're going to find that most of the senior partners my age that are in charge of the firm, they don't know the stuff. And they're going to delegate it to you. And there's going to come a time when you're going to be signing the discovery responses. And you don't want to end up like the Qualcomm associate. You want to make sure that, uh, that you do something that is going to further your reputation. Because that's always more important than any one particular fee is the long term of your reputation. So uh, my, my urging to all of you is, is to keep that in mind and use your time now in law school to study up on this stuff. Okay, uh, we'll hear our first response from uh, Bill Hamilton. Thank you, Ralph. I um, guess we're going to hear a little bit of a bulldog approach next. Um, uh, very happy to be here. This is lovely being in this facility modeled on Independence Hall. I'm from Philadelphia, so it makes me feel uh, right at home. Uh, and I don't have a Brooklyn accent, but you may detect a little bit of Philadelphia in me. I do a, a Yo Adrian pretty well. Um, uh, and some other choice expressions from Philadelphia, to be cheesesteak and other things, but it's it's fun to be here uh, in the, uh, the Mercer version of Independence Hall. Ralph has made a number of important points, and what he's attempted to do is diagnose the root causes of the discovery failures, which by all reports are not abating, and that's the crisis we're facing right now. Why is it that attorneys are going into court uh, ill-equipped uh, to handle the discovery matters? Ralph traces the problem uh, to a failure to understand basic technology issues associated with a discovery. In short, what we've heard all morning is that we have a competence gap. You can't uh, diligently represent the client without knowing this area and knowing competence in ESI. This is what attorneys seem to be lacking. But what does it mean to, to have the discovery competence? Well, for me, in the practicing field, it means basically two things. First, it means I'm incompetent of having the kind of dialogue with the other side about a discovery that will advance the interest of my clients. And second of all, if I'm incompetent with respect to discovery, it means I'm incompetent of having the kinds of dialogue I have to have with my own client in order to protect and advance the cause of my own client. Without this rudimentary knowledge, Ralph argues attorneys will pray to the sins of zealousness and the failure of a duty of candor to the court and opposing counsel. I agree with Ralph that the lack of rudimentary knowledge is at the core of the problem. But from my perspective, this lack of competence leads to a failure of advocacy. I don't believe that e-discovery requires attorney to be any less zealous, any less engaged, and any less dedicated to the cause of the client. In fact, the opposite is the case. You cannot adequately represent your client zealously without having e-discovery competence. I'm also of the opinion that e-discovery does not lessen the duty of confidentiality and loyalty to our client, nor do we need to run away from the adversary nature of the litigation system. Our problem stems from the unfortunate fact that lawyers simply do not know how to be zealous e-discovery advocates. Today I'm speaking to you from the perspective of a commercial litigator. And uh, when I started practicing law, uh, the battlefield of litigation had switched from the trial phase to the discovery phase. Very few cases historically over the past 20 to 30 years, and it's getting worse, went to trial in the commercial context. We're now down, I think, to about 2 or 3 percent of cases going to trial. We had to get ready for trial. You never wanted to hire a lawyer that didn't want to go to trial or wasn't prepared to go to trial. But the truth of the matter that we all faced was that cases were likely to settle once the odds became apparent. Businessmen, corporations, and people in general are risk adverse for the most part. Once the facts are out, uh, once the uh, dialogue and the discovery process has produced a general setting, people would calculate the loss, potential for risk, and come to some kind of general settlement zone. Trial attorneys thus had become, for the most part, litigators. Now, unless if ca cases were going to be settled for the most part, the winner was going to be the side that won in discovery. 
And this led to a whole series of discovery problems. And what did winning discovery mean? For the better attorneys, it meant getting the facts out that made your case more probably the likely victor. It also meant resisting what was always perceived to be overreaching discovery from the other side in the form of too many interrogatories, too many requests for production, too many and too long depositions. Over the past 20 years, though, rules were implemented to control what were perceived as abuses by various sides, limiting uh, depositions and limiting <coughs> ranges of discovery. Unfortunately to many litigators, the goal was to frustrate the opposition's <coughs> efforts to build a case against your client and vigorously, while vigorously attempting to build the case on the other side. The point, though, that I want to make is that it was the responsibility of the lawyer to build your case on your own with the tools and the equipment that the rules of civil procedure provided to you. If I was a better attorney, if I had more resources to deploy, if I worked harder, so much the better, and I used these skills for the advantage of my client. I didn't feel sorry for the other side who approached the case differently. No one provided me any quarter in my career as a litigator, and I wouldn't have expected it at any time. Indeed, the litigation culture requires a certain advocacy tendency, a certain kind of a lust for, uh, for combat. In my law firm, the, when I first started practicing, the attorney that was uh, in charge of hiring I was very interested in hiring bright students that did very well in law school and had all the typical uh, qualifications. But he was also interested in students, men and women, who had participated in athletic events and athletic competitions. I'm not suggesting that makes you a better competitor or a better attorney, uh, having athletic prowess. But what it does suggest is that was the mindset of the world of the past 20 or 30 years. And I don't intend to judge that adversary culture. I think we didn't judge the other side. It was their responsibility. Uh, the legal myth uh, that was always prevalent was that there was never bad lawyering. Uh, there were simply different litigation strategies that attorneys employed. And for example, over my career, I've heard many statements such as, I'm glad they never found out about Sally. That would have sunk our case. Or, I wonder why they didn't ask those doc about those documents at the deposition. That would have been a thread that may have unraveled the case. Or after a case, boy, can you believe it? They never asked for the personnel file of John. I never once suggested to the opposition during my career, nor do I intend to going forward, that they miss something or should ask another question or that they might want to talk with a certain witness unless I thought it would be good for my client and the client had approved the strategy. To do so, in my opinion, without client approval, would have violated my duty of zealous representation and loyalty. You don't tell the other side of the chess match that they might want to reconsider the previous move unless you're playing with your kids. I can't imagine any attorney saying to a client at the end of the deposition, which is about to conclude that, hey, wait, I want to go talk to the other side and take a break for a moment because he's missed asking you some questions that would really be painful for you to answer. It's not going to happen in the, in the litigation culture that we have, and it wouldn't be right because it would violate my duties uh, to my client. Litigation was designed to be rough and tumble. Ralph talks about bulldogs. Ralph talks about an adversary culture. Uh, there's knights in shining armor you hear. Uh, as though those terms were supposed to be uh, pejoratives. My opinion is, is that we have a buy into our judicial process because clients believe that they're going to be zealously represented by their attorneys. That's why it works. That's why people believe in it, because they've got someone at their side to stand with them to fight the battles that need to be fought. Now, let's be clear about that. That's not to engage in unlawful behavior. And for the most part, what you see in some sanctions cases and spoliation cases is simply clearly fraudulent, unlawful behavior. But I don't think that's the big problem. I don't think that's the core of the problem. The principles of client loyalty and confidentiality will not work, will not work, if the lawyer is required to disclose what the lawyer is told in confidence that the lawyer is not otherwise lawfully required to disclose. Litigators hate disclosures. That word drives me nuts. I don't like it. It makes me stay up at night worried. 
I'm not going to do the work for the other side that I don't have to do. This has always been protected by the work product doctrine. Now, now we have the ESI world. And we're confronted with a brand new universe over the past 10 or 15 years. No one doubts that the ESI world is different. You've heard about that this morning. Ralph and I, and his blog and other places together, have called upon law schools to teach e-discovery skills to students. Indeed, this is an important pressing challenge that I believe is on the agenda for our nation's law schools. But in my opinion, the digital world requires more and smarter adversarial talents, which litigators simply don't have. And that's where the problem is. It's a real problem because virtually today, as Ralph indicated, all information is digital. Well, there, when there's paper, it's printed from the digital source. The point being is you can't function in the modern world without litigation in the modern world, without understanding e-discovery, and without being equipped for those skills. I see the failure of today not so much in the fact that litigators are trained to be adversaries and trained in the combat of litigation, but the litigators are lacking two, two key skills. They don't know how to enter dialogue with their own clients about e-discovery, its cost, and counsel required for its involvement. Attorneys also don't have the skills to engage in e-discovery dialogue with the opposition. What do I mean about e-discovery skills and talking to your client? These have been referred to as the Zubilay uh, ethics. Clients, although many of them live in their businesses in a digital environment, simply can't translate the legal requirements of preservation and production on their own without the guidance of counsel. It used to be that uh, we'd send a client a request for production and then we'd have 10 or 20 boxes would come to the office and then we'd start working through them. That doesn't work anymore. What e-discovery attorneys have to do is have to be more involved in learning and knowing their client's technology systems. Case after case, I'll talk to a client about preservation of electronic information. Um, well, we sent out an email and told everybody to preserve their, uh, their electronic information. Well, about what? Well, about the case. Well, what did you tell them about the case? Well, we told them it got sued by X. Well, did you tell them what the issues were? Did you tell them what the keywords were? Did you explain to them not only do they have to preserve their information on their desktops, but they have to preserve information on Blackberries, home computers when they're doing remote work? Did you talk to the IT department? No, no, we didn't do it. We had to do that. Yes, that's a requirement. And it's an unpleasant conversation frequently with clients because they don't want to hear it, but it's your duty as a zealous advocate for them to protect them, to make sure they don't make the mistakes of spoilation that will come on down the road later if it's not done properly. Second of all, I wholeheartedly agree uh, with the dialogue we've heard earlier that you have to engage the other side in e-discovery debates. You have to have those skills. Why don't litigators want to do it? I think, I think there was Jason who hit it on the head a little bit earlier. You've got to spend a lot more time with people that you don't like. <laughs> Frankly, litigators don't like to socialize. Litigators typically have personalities that are wonderful when performing in an audience, but you put them at a cocktail party or you put them in a normal social environment and they're the people off in the corner that don't want to talk to anybody. They like to have that structure. Frankly, the office attorneys in many ways are the best attorneys to engage in e-discovery dialogue because they're used to doing deals. And what deal making involves is disclosure, discussion of risk, discussion of benefits, and coming to a conclusion and testing the results out. Litigators have to learn those skills and they have to be taught early on by law firms and they have to be taught by law schools. The real problem that I see in terms of the ethical dilemmas that we've talked about earlier today have to do with timing. The problem with e-discovery is that timing is everything. Data can be lost very quickly. So what happens when a case comes in is the attorneys have to be working very quickly with their clients in order to preserve data. Uh, you have to engage in that client dialogue. That raises the question of disclosure at the early Rule 25, 20, uh, 26F conference, before any discovery has been propounded, before any interrogatories have been propounded, and before the case is really launched. The question arises then, what is my duty of disclosure before a formal request for production has been made, 
before I have an obligation to, uh, to engage uh, in the process of diligently finding the relevant information. It's easy once a request to produce is propounded. There's no doubt that I've got to locate the locations of data. I've got to meet with the other side. We have to engage in our, our due diligence. And I engage with them. They want to talk about the search terms they want. I talk about the search terms we want. Uh, we bring in some experts, perhaps, and engage in a dialogue and come to a conclusion. That's the easy part. Most attorneys can't do it, but it's still the easy part. Uh, the tougher part is, uh, what is my duty of disclosure prior to the propounding of interrogatories, prior to uh, production, and prior to other disclosure requirements? That's the tough part. Let's take, uh, let's take a hypothetical. Suppose it's the case that um, uh, a case comes in, and uh, my clients, uh, and I have to interview one of my client's former employees. I visit with her, and she says really bad things about my client. Things I know that aren't true, but says really bad things. And she says, guess what? Uh, I also created some documents that are located and, sh and saved on the G file within the company. And he also has uh, personal emails and other information that have been taken that he's uh, she stored uh, herself on her own system. Well, of course, what I do is I immediately engage in the preservation exercise of preserving the information, uh, as, uh, do what I need to do uh, to obtain it from the, uh, from the former employee of her home computer, uh, preserve the G drive at work, and take other steps to preserve the email. Uh, the problem then becomes, uh, what do I do at the Rule 26F conference? It's my work product. I discovered the witness. I preserved the data. Do I have a duty in, in the process of having a dialogue with the opposition about what data should be preserved in the litigation hold uh, to disclose uh, the existence of this particular hostile witness? But I may have taken uh, a, an image of their hard drive so that it couldn't be damaged or destroyed. My general sense is no. That can wait as long as I've done the proper job of preservation for the interrogatory and the request to produce. It's my opinion that in developing ESI law, lawyers, courts, and the bar need to be very careful uh, to protect against the voluntary disclosure of information that wouldn't otherwise lawfully be required. We cannot put the responsibility on attorneys to disclose information obtained in confidence from their clients without a requirement. So, in short, what I think Ralph has pointed out vigorously uh, and clearly is that attorney incompetence is at the heart of our, of our crisis. Uh, what I think, however, is that this competence really is not so much a failure of candor to the court and a failure of the duty of the opposition. It's a failure of the duty of adequate, diligent representation of our clients. And what we don't want to do is damage the principles that underlie that, namely loyalty and confidentiality, in coming up with a solution. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak from here. Oh, you want to speak from here? Yeah. Uh, the second responder of this panel, Judge David Baker, uh, the judge used to speak about uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for, for questions. Okay. I, I'm used to uh, speaking from set, center spot and sitting down, so I, that's what I'm going to do. That's, that's where we are on the bench. Um, I, I will ease just a little bit. I, I, I started running computer programs uh, literally over 40 years ago. I was just thinking about it back in high school. Uh, and have followed technology more or less ever since. Uh, some, you know, Not much in law school back then, but... Uh, uh, I've always been interested in science and, and uh, math. And I've been on the bench now about 17 years. And one of my first duties beyond the, the uh, cases was uh, getting involved with judicial education, and in particular, trying to get judges interested in technology. Uh, and we had classes that were set up, uh, uh, and our, the committee tried to put together some of the curricula for that. Our first goal was to try to figure out some way to motivate judges to turn computers on. Uh, and, and this was right at the era when I left my law firm, there were no attorneys with computers on their desks. After I left, that's all changed. Uh, 
when I started as a judge, judges had computers, but the only thing that was really on there was Westlaw. And there was a version, a DOS version of WordPerfect. Uh, and very few judges used the machines at all. We had no email. Uh, there was no network. Uh, that's all changed, obviously. Uh, the big change there, I think, in getting judges motivated was World Wide Web when, when that became popular in the uh, early to mid-90s. Uh, so that, that's the background. And so when Judge Fasciola talks about, or, or Jason talks about, uh, judges getting involved as case managers in your uh, solving, helping you solve your problems in litigation, you're, you're going to be find a hit and miss. There, there are not many judges who are going to help you do your search protocols. Uh, be a few, but not too many. Uh, and I think judges have the same obligation that we're laying on you today to be more conversant with this and to, to understand them better, but, but recognize that, that that's the bench you're dealing with. There are going to be some people that are that are like me or like Judge Fasciola, but there are going to be a lot more judges that that don't want to hear it, but if they do, they may not understand it. So even if you get proficient at this, you may have a, an educational responsibility to, to teach the judges <coughs> how, to, how to handle all this. Uh, my intention here in responding to what's been said both in the first panel and, and here is to give you a little perspective on this and then a couple of tips. Uh, I. My perspective on this, having, having been at it for a little while, is that the, the problems of the burden of discovery predate any of us, uh, no matter how much gray hair we've got, uh, and, and parties complaining about the burdens of discovery. That's not new. Uh, what's new is that within my practice time, we've gone from an era where almost all documents that you looked at were originals. That was, that was phasing out, just as I... Uh, became aware of, of, of the world as the Xerox machine became popular. And the Xerox machine creates a certain number of copies that go out, go out within an organization or out in the world, and it was a, certainly a lot easier to, uh, I mean, it used to be the, the federal rules were written where you could inspect and copy documents, but that literally meant 100 years ago, 50 years ago, that you'd bring the other side into your client's office and they could sit and look at the documents and make notes or make a hand copy of it. Uh, well, the Xerox machine changed that, so it's a lot easier to make a single copy or a few copies. But the world has completely changed yet again with the electronic copies. And that was alluded to by some of the other speakers. The spread of information within an organization, the same information, it may now go to a thousand people or a hundred people, whereas before it might go to two or three. Uh, and there would be only one copy kept, or, or only the original. Those, now the, the e-copies are everywhere, and they may be different, or they may be identical, but that's the spread of information, and I think that's what Ralph was alluding to, that you know, the tendency of clients to want to bend the, break the rules and, and destroy evidence, that, that's always there, that's always out there, that's an issue that we as professionals have to uh, counsel them and, and help them avoid. But now it does become discovered more, because when they take uh, a deposition of somebody who only tangentially involved, but they've got copies of everything. Or enough, copies of enough things that it, it discloses where the things are that weren't produced. So things come to light uh, much, uh, come, come out of left field a lot easier. So that's, that's part of the issue. Um, just a tip for you, it, and, and I, I think this was uh, embedded in, in some of the anecdotes that Judge Fasciola talked about is you have to, as you, as you start a case, you're the litigator assigned, but you pay the defendant, it doesn't matter. You've got to think, you know, what, where am I starting in terms of a cubby hole or a pigeonhole for this? Is this one where I think there's going to be spoliation, where there's going to be a huge case where the costs of getting the information are going to threaten to be worth far more than the case is, or is this just a routine one? And you have to gauge yourself accordingly in terms of how you deal with your client and with the opposing side. Uh, I think one problem, and, and Ralph has talked about this elsewhere, the, a lot of people you're going to be seeing on the other side think this e-discovery thing only involves technology cases, and that's wrong. I mean, uh, the examples we've, we've heard this morning, almost all the information now, whether it's a divorce case or a mortgage foreclosure or a patent case, is a, 
one where you'd expect it, but in any contract dispute, it's, it's all going to be digital information. So you've got to have that mindset from the beginning. Um, and here's just a practice tip, and this is this is echoing a little bit of what Ralph said. You've got to have enough technical expertise. You're not going to be computer experts, but you have to understand how this stuff is stored generally, just as you. As a business lawyer, you have to understand how the businesses that you represent operate. Uh, and, and you have to have that general level of knowledge just to be able to go out and be a professional in, in a, a uh, area of practice that, that calls upon you to know how business works. Uh, and again, that's a difference from the paper age to the electronic age. I think people thought back in the paper age, you have a general idea how businesses store their paper and their information. In a given case or a given client, you'd have to become more familiar with that. The burden now is not only to have that general information so that you can formulate requests and think about how you're going to uh, describe the information that's important. You now have to have that conversation with your client to get specific information about how they store their information. Because what you're being called upon to do in the heat of litigation is to identify and solve the client's information management deficiencies. That doesn't work very well uh, because your client isn't going to do it before you get into litigation. So you've got to, you've got this obligation to help them improve their organization. That's true whether it's a corporation or an individual. Uh, the individuals may keep information in a lot of funny places and and uh, spread it to places that you don't expect. So uh, that's you know, just as if you were representing. Uh, uh, somebody in Ben Lake litigation, you've got to know the difference between Ben Lake WP and Ben Lake DF before you get into the case. Uh, on the, on the, or if it's a patent case, you've got to know how a uh, particular widget operates. Uh, in every case, you've got to have this knowledge about how the information flows uh, within the company or within uh, your individual client. Let me stop there. I don't know if the questions. Okay. Do you have any questions? for any of our panelists or panelists have questions for each other. Your Honor. Well, what about certification? Would it make sense that you could not hold yourself out Bill, as confident in this area unless your ability to do so was certified by a third party? Does that make sense? Is that right? it, uh, I think it makes sense. Um, we talked about that uh, at the University of Florida developing a certification program for e-discovery as a kind of minor. So we're engaged in that dialogue with the dean. Uh, also, in Florida, we have board certification in Florida for subject matter specialties. And it seems to me that uh, what I contemplated is taking to the bar a certification for electronic discovery. And Ralph and I have talked about that as well. And that strikes me as something that's uh, important and on the horizon for us. If I could just comment, that Bill is, is actually board certified in two areas, right. uh, business litigation and intellectual property. Uh, I am not board certified in anything, and, uh, I, and he's talked about, shouldn't we ask for board certification in e-discovery, which I think I probably could get certified in there. But uh, I honestly uh, am kind of discouraging that, because number one, Florida hasn't even adopted rules yet. And we're having a double the time getting the whole bar to understand that evidence is not in the filing cabinets anymore. That I think, you know, maybe getting ahead of ourselves to actually ask for a certification. And, and I don't like to start a battle I can't win. I, I, and I, I, I think having gone through the Florida bar certification process, the, the, trying to set standards for IP litigators, patent litigators. I think at this stage, for the same reason that Chilton was sort of being a little bit defensive about the new rule, we don't know enough about what we're talking about, I think, to set the certification standards yet. Other questions? Yes, I wanted to ask about the Qualcomm case and the court's eventual decision to allow the lawyers to invoke self-defense based upon the declarations that were filed. Do any of you think that that's, in a sense, sort of an expansion of a lawyer's right to self-defense? It wasn't traditional areas. The court said that those declarations raised what was known, as, according to the court, as accusatorial adversity. And I wondered if you thought that was sort of a broadening of a lawyer's right to self-defense. Uh, I did not. I mean, that was a quirk of California bar rules. It was made a little bit, I think it would have been easier. 
I was shocked that they muzzled them to begin with. And, and what Qualcomm did is they waited until the last minute and filed affidavits from their people accusing their outside counsel of, of, of basically it was all their fault. They did it at the last minute, so it was kind of the judge didn't really have a chance to face it. And I think the magistrate made a, a wrong ruling on that, and the district court agreed and reversed it. I mean, if you're being accused of lying to the court and of withholding uh, evidence, key evidence, and, and in fact, you were told to do it by your client, I don't think that excuses you, but I think you should be able to at least that, talk about it. But that is contrary to existing California case law, because California has the most stringent confidentiality requirements. So I would, I, I kind of think it is an expansion. Maybe in California. That's why it was all unique, California, which I'm not an expert on at all. Judge, it's been true for as long as I can remember that in a criminal case, a claim of ineffectiveness opens the lawyer's mouth, i.e., he's claiming that I pled him guilty. Well, son of a gun, he told me he was guilty. But that was a so, client complaint. This is not. This was not a client complaint. That's why it's distinguishable. Other questions? Yeah, I think everybody's coming. Ralph, let me, let me, let me throw, because this goes back to something that Judge Fischel said, in terms of mediations and, and special masters to resolve these. Um, in, in, a, in a case that's still pending that I can't talk about in any detail, I appointed a special master to uh, help the parties solve technical as well as negotiation problems over electronically stored information. I have no idea how much that special master has billed. It's uh, a lot. Uh, he's a lawyer from, from uh, Texas who uh, uh, practices, and a lot of his practice is being a special master in such cases, and there are other people who do that. Uh, I felt it was sort of a failure partly on their, on their lawyer's part and a little bit on my part that we had to engage somebody to do that. What, what any perspective on that from actually either of you? Well, I think everybody in the field thinks that's going to be the future, and it's because the judges we have today are unfortunately the rare exception. Your typical judge doesn't know anything more about computers than your typical lawyer, not very much. And they get in over their head, they don't have enough time, they won't get into it, they won't concern themselves with what's the best keyword. And so the bottom line is the parties know that, and the parties say, we want actually a fair adjudication. The judge won't give it to us, doesn't have the time, doesn't have the ability, so we'll hire a judge. Limited to these particular focused issues of e-discovery. Specialty judges, specialty special masters. I think that for a short term that will happen. Ultimately, the, the bench and the bar will get to the point they don't need that anymore, but right now they need it, they need it big time. So, uh, you know, I think Sedona Conference that predicts this will happen. Uh, Eric has a lot of opinions that mention that. The funny thing is now that the judges now kind of use it as a punishment. Okay, you guys can't figure it out. I'm going to uh, make you pay for a special master. Uh, and you know, if you can't figure it out, if you stay in that locked room overnight, that hasn't happened yet, but then someday it'll happen. Uh, you may have to hire somebody to spend literally, I mean, to get into these areas sometimes, it, it just takes a lot of time. It takes hundreds and hundreds of hours to figure out the details. The complexity of these computer systems is almost beyond comprehension, and it changes every day. Just when you think you've got it, They've invented, uh, you know, the latest Google applications that make it all irrelevant. We got to learn again. All right, uh, we've got time. Maybe one more short. In the discovery, do you get hard copy on paper or do you get it on a disk? And when you get it on a disk, can they send it to you in any form, or can you specify, hey, make it a PDF so we can read it? Let, let me let me respond. The the issue of the format uh, is addressed. With some degree in the in the rule, this is part of your obligation, though, as the requester and as the responder, to think about what format you want it in. Do you want it in what's called native format? Do you want it as a TIFF file? Do you want it as a PDF file? Do you want it in some format that is how it's originally stored, or do you want it in some way that you're going to be able to manipulate it after you've got it? If it's if it's spreadsheets. You probably don't want to print out. You want it electronically so you can play with the numbers yourself a little bit with a, with a copy of it. Or if it's, you want it to be text searchable rather than uh, something else. Uh, and, but that's what you've got to think through, both in describing what the scope is that's going to be material and relevant, 
and appropriate to search, but then how you want it. And that was one of the, I mean, I've had that problem come up where one side's asked for it another way, one way, and the other side says, no, we can't, we won't produce it to you that way, it's not reasonable. Uh, it turns out, not only it was reasonable, but it was the only way to do it, and so we ended up having to do it twice at great expense. Uh, so that's a matter of this, what this cooperation should be. That should not be adversarial. That should be cooperative. We'll be there if you can't resolve it. But that's one where you need to, you, need, you know, both sides have got the obligation to be smart enough about what they're doing to figure out which, what, what it's going to cost to do it this way versus this way. What are you going to do with it after you get it? Do uh, you need to supply it to an expert who's going to have to analyze it? Do you, do you want to have it in a database so that you can do some other kinds of searches on it? Uh, are you, you know, what is it that you, do you need the metadata or do you not need the metadata? Those are things you have to think through before you go to the expense, and that's why sampling sometimes is better. Depends on the, you know the needs of the case. Well, we don't want to have a verbal dispute about that, but I think it is adversarial, and, I'm, and I don't like that word being chased out of the process. It's just as adversarial as negotiating with the other side where we're going to hold the depositions and whose office. And that's not to say we shouldn't come to an agreement about that. We don't want to take that to the court. But I'm representing my client's interest in trying to find the best location where my client is going to perform in a superior manner at the deposition, and negotiating the other side with the other side about it. So it is adversarial, but we need to come to a conclusion about it. Well, and you're supposed to start having that conversation at the meeting confer. I mean, among the things you're supposed to discuss at the Rule 26 F conference is form or forms of production, and and it actually says form or forms. Because what we're talking about here is a variety of different kinds of electronically stored information. Where a form of production of maybe TIFF with extracted text would make sense for email, it will not make sense for, say, a database extraction. Or even perhaps Excel spreadsheets with formulas running in the background. So what the rules contemplate is you start having that discussion and hopefully reach an agreement as early as the 26F conference. And then what the, what the rule on request for production says is that the requesting party gets the first shot across the bow on requesting forms of production, but doesn't have to take it, which I think is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting twist on the rules here. So they may, but are not required to state the form in which they want the information that comes back in response to that request for production. But the responding party, if they either uh, object to the form in which the requesting party has made the request, or if they object, um, uh, or if the, the requesting party hasn't stated a form, is required in their responses to state how they're producing it. And I think the goal there was to avoid having to have, bring this dispute to the court after the productions have been made and somebody receives a form that they're unsatisfied with. So they're trying to push that uh, as early as the meeting confer and get it resolved, if you will, before anything ever changes hands. This highlights the, it's not just a terminology change from request for documents to request for information. And the high, it highlights the difference between originals and Xeroxes and, and digital information because the information doesn't necessarily have a form. Or, or it, may be, you know, it may be different when it's inside an active me email box versus being on an archive. Or you know, when it's calculations here that then get put into a final spreadsheet that's used for analysis to support uh, a, a new drug application. Or, uh, things like that. So the information is just sort of out there and it's a little fuzzy sometimes. It's not a document. It's not a document until you do something with it. You know, a web page. What is a web page? Is it what shows up on the screen or is it the HTML coding that's back behind it? If it's a dynamic one, does it depend which computer you're or which browser you're using? I mean, it's going to look different. Uh, and it's going to look different at 12.14, then it's going to look at 12.17. Well, and it looked different last week than it looks today. Right. And it looked different tomorrow. And if it's uh, White, White House email, I guess it won't be there. <laughs> Speak, speaking of 12.14, uh, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. CLA folks lunches on your own for the uh, participants and invited guests uh, and faculty lunches at the Woodruff House uh, for our guests. Uh, if you'll follow me, uh, we'll just walk next door to the Woodruff House. We'll see you at 1.30 for the third panel.